Hello, and welcome to Texas Holocaust Remembrance Week 2021. My name is Nami Echelov, and I'm the Holocaust Memorial Museum of San Antonio's director, as well as the interim CEO for the Jewish Federation of San Antonio. We want to thank you for joining us for this special program, as well as to thank the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission for underwriting all the production costs associated. Hello, my name is Julie Zucker, and I'm the Director of Jewish Engagement and Learning at the Jewish Federation of San Antonio. Before I introduce our speaker, Dr. Anatoly Trachtenbreut, who will speak about his father's experience, I'd like to give you some background information on Romania, the birthplace of David Trachtenbreut. The progression of the final solution Further east saw many countries occupied or allied with Nazi Germany take the opportunity to deal with the Jewish question in many ways. In 1930, a census of the Romanian population showed that 4% of the population was Jewish. Similar to other Eastern European countries, there was a fair amount of anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish feelings among the non-Jewish population. The fascist Iron Guard, a group of right-wing nationalists, called for Jews to be expelled from Romania. After the fall of France in 1940, Romania lost one of their strongest allies. The countries of Hungary, Bulgaria, and the Soviet Union forced Romania to cede territory to them. Not long after 30% of its territory was taken, King Carol, the second was overthrown in a coup led by right-wing general Ion Antonescu and the Iron Guard. With this coup, Romania officially joined Nazi Germany as an ally. With no prompting from the Nazi forces, the Iron Guard began to rob and seize Jewish-owned businesses. In the capital city of Bucharest, a pogrom, which is a large-scale act of violence against people of Jewish descent, occurred and took the lives of many Jews. When Nazi Germany attacked the Soviet Union in June 1941 in Operation Barbarossa, Romanian forces were part of the attacking forces. Romania retook the territory that was taken from them by the Soviet Union and began to initiate on their own the massacre of the Jewish populations of this area. Romanian forces established ghettos and herded those who had survived the massacres into ghettos to be used for forced labor. While Romanian forces cleansed their newly gained territory of its Jewish population, the Old Kingdom, or the territory that made up the first independent Romanian kingdom, was spared from the harsh actions taking place in the outer territory. Starting late in 1942 and continuing into 1943, General Ion Antonescu stopped deportations of Jews out of Romania despite mounting pressure for not from Nazi officials. The policy in the Old Kingdom became one of, the, one of exploitation and not in line with Nazi Germany's final solution. As the tide turned against Germany, countries allied with them decided to take different approaches to the final solution. The leader of Romania worried about the amount of dead Jews in his territory and took steps for a possible peace treaty with the Allied forces. While no Jews were being deported, General Antonescu heavily taxed and used the Jewish population for forced labor. The 1930 census shows nearly 730,000 who identified as Jewish, but by 1945, 290,000 to 360,000 Romanian Jews are estimated to have survived the Holocaust. My name is Anatole Trachtenbreut. I'm a cardiologist here in San Antonio, and I, I will be discussing the experience of my father. His name is David Trachtenbreut, who's also a physician. He lives in San Antonio, but he's 92 years old now, so it is very difficult for him to discuss everything. But my father was born in a small Romanian town of Briciane in 1928. He grew up in, in, in a family with his younger brother, who was four years younger than him. 
My dad's father was a farmer in Romania, and they grew wheat, soybeans, corn, and sunflowers. They also had extensive fruit orchards and worked with his brother Yona on the land, which was owned by them as well as one of their brothers by the name of Abraham. The grains and fruit were exported to the Western Europe as well as the former Soviet Union. My father's family had about 150 head of sheep for wool production, as well as production of caracal, which is a very tightly uh, wound uh, fur that was imported to Western Europe as well as Soviet Union for fur coats. My father, David Trachtenbreut, went to a local Hader. Hader was an elementary school which was run by the rabbis where the kids would only learn Hebrew alphabet, religion, as well as uh, how to learn the Torah or Bible. And uh, after they advanced, they would go into different disciplines. It was a very small school and the kids spent the entire day there. After my dad finished the Hato, the local school, he attended the government school, where in addition to the Romanian language, he studied German, French, and Latin. He also took the usual subjects, as all of you do, math and sciences, which were requ required. My father also had to study with the rabbi at home after school. My father was kind of a prankster, and my grandmother, who I remember very well, she told me that uh, my father once glued the beard of the rabbi to the table because the rabbi had the motion where he would shake his head and had a very long beard. They had to apologize to the rabbi, and my father got into trouble after that. My grandmother also recalled that she would throw candies from the attic if my father did a good job, and he thought that it came from heaven or from God. My father's family celebrated Shabbat every week, and he attended synagogue services with his grandfather, Nachman Trachtenbreut. My dad remembers that his grandfather always wanted to know if my dad recalled and understood the chapter of the week that they studied in school, and he questioned them during the Sabbath meals. The right answers were always rewarded with sweets and kisses. My father told me he still remembers the sensation of those kisses. During Sabbath services, my father would sneak out of the synagogue to play soccer with his friends and would return back to his relative's home. My father was a very active child and rode horses on their farm. He was involved in athletics and enjoyed photography. He would travel with his parents to Europe where his father was treated for goldstones. My father also traveled with his parents and grandmother to Berlin on one occasion. The town of Brichane had about 9,000 people living before the war, with 90% of population being Jewish. Brichane was, had five synagogues, it had several Jewish sports organization, organizations, several social clubs. There were meeting of young Zionists as well as the meeting of the Jewish communists. Of course, there was a Hebra Kaddisha, which is a burial society, a Jewish hospital for the poor, as well as Jewish community organization, which provided funds to supply food for poor Jews for Sabbath, for Passover, and other Jewish holidays. The reason the Jewish hospital was established is because the Romanian government would not accept poor Jews 
to, into the governmental hospitals, so the community had to provide care for them. In 1940, my father started preparing for his bar mitzvah when he was turning 13, which would take place in June of 1941. But it was never meant to be. In June 28th of 1940, the Soviet Union occupied the part of Romania where they lived, known as Bessarabia, as well as the part of Poland and Baltic Republics as a result of famous Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, where at that time part of Europe were divi divided between Nazi Germany and Stalin's government. Joseph Stalin was the head of the Politburo of the Soviet Communist Party at that time. The German government took over Western Poland while the Soviet Union occupied the areas that I described. My father remembers that the Soviet soldiers arrived by trucks and many local people, as well as local communists, greeted them with glee. The soldiers proceeded to buy everything in the local groceries and assorted merchandise shops. Of course, they were paying in rubles, which, were, which is a Soviet currency, and the conversion rate was artificially altered, so the merchants lost all their money very rapidly. My father did not know anything about this former Soviet Union and did not know about repressions of Stalin. He never heard of Holodomor, which was a, a Holocaust by Soviet regime in Western Ukraine, where the grain was withheld from the peasants who would not join the collective farms organized by the Soviet government at that time. Over five million people perished at that time, and this is not well known in history. My grandfather's business, of course, was nationalized, and he had to work for the government of course, at a much reduced rate in rubles. But in addition to that, immediately repressions had started against the Jews. My father's fraternal grandmother was labeled as bourgeoisie, and all of her property, as well as her house, was taken over by the Soviet Union. Her husband, or my father's grandfather, Nachman, died in 1939, and she was persecuted just because they used to have several brick-making factories in several small towns around Brichane. At that time, also 30 members of the local community were loaded on trucks and taken to the trains and were exiled to Siberia because they were accused of being American spies, but the real reason was because they were prominent citizens. My father's uncle, Abraham Trachtenbreut, who was a physician and president of the Jewish Community Council, was exiled as well. This action did save some of the Jewish lives because what the slaughter was followed in 11 months. My father was immediately re-educated into the communist ideology, ideology as well into Russian language. Four out of five synagogues were immediately closed and all the Hebrew and Yiddish school, which is an old intellect uh, dialect of German that you, you, Jews used in Europe, as well as all kosher were closed and all the kosher food became non-existent. On June 22nd in 1941, Operation Barbarossa started. 
Operation Barbarossa was a attack on a former Soviet Union by Nazi troops. And in a very short time, the Nazis invaded our state and start the problems. When they invaded us, in the same day they announced the people, that people had the right to kill us, that the people have the right to rob us, to do with us what they want. And in this day, the people took away everything from the us what we had. They killed a lot of us. My father recalls vividly that the Nazi and Romanian troops entered the town of Briciane. One of my aunts, Maria Zilber Trachtenbreut, whose husband was exiled to Siberia, was informed by the local leaders because of her being a very prominent person who visited their house and they had connection to the former king of Romania that all the Jews will be deported in several days. My, other, my father's other memories of occupations were immediate reactions of the local Ukrainian and Romanian populace who started beating and killing the Jews on the streets with the Nazi soldiers looking on. The fascist troops threw all of the Jews out of their houses and into the street. My father bright moment during that time, his recollection about Ukrainian citizen by the name Stepan Vladislavsky, who took the whole family for the night to stay in his house. That included my father, his brother, his parents, as well as the grandmother who was thrown out of her home. My father never forgot that kindness. And when he became a physician in our city, he assisted Mr. Vladislavsky's granddaughter to become a physician as well. The next day, when my father, his parents, his brother and grandmother arrived to their house, they witnessed the theft of all the furniture, all the cooking utensils, which was done by the local population in the anti-Semitic fervor. The family had to spend a night in the covered area where the sheep were housed during the winter. The next day, all the Jews were told to appear in the morning with minimal luggage in a market square. My grandmother made her sons wear several layers of clothes. It was extremely hot. My father also recalls the sounds of the homeless dogs and cats around the town. That was the most pronounced to him and they couldn't take, of course, their dog. They were made to line up six in a row by the local gendarmes, Nazis, Romanian troops, as well as civilian Ukrainian and Romanian collaborators. They were hitting and screaming at them, and the elderly Jews who were slow to walk were beaten. And they ordered us to go. We didn't know where to go ahead. It was the end of June. It was hot. It was 35, 30. And we walked all day. Nobody had the right to go from the line, left or right. If somebody did it, he was shot immediately. Here. My father remembers a local rabbi and his son. The rabbi's name was Rab Shlomo. His son's name was Samuel Rabinovich, who had many sidurim or prayer books hidden in his coat, as well as a book of Torah or humash was, uh, scroll was uh, wrapped around him. 
He collapsed because of his bad heart and his body was left on the street. There were no food or drink for the first three days and the local population was laughing at the marching Jews but did a brisk trade for a few ounces of water or rotten potatoes in exchange for their extra clothes or any valuables. When the columns of Jews arrived at the banks of the river Nestor, many people jumped into the water because of thirst and were shot by the Nazis. In a couple hours, we crossed the river, but they prohibit strictly not to go to the river. You understand what this was? Children, old people, no water. The first night my father remembers at the banks of the river was spent without any blankets, any pillows or food. They had to sleep on the ground. In the evening they stopped us on the edge of a big forest. We sat on the ground. They brought dogs who surrendered us. And if somebody tried to go out, he was killed immediately. We used to do everything, lie right here. You imagine what this is. After three days of travel, they stopped in a town on Vertigiane in a barbed wire area and stayed in the ghetto for three months or until October of 1941. My father recalls that they slept in a room with about six other people, so one room had to accommodate 10 people. They were not allowed to use outside facilities at night and the bucket of excrement was producing a terrible, nauseating smell. The days at the ghetto were spent in meaningless work, carrying rocks from one side of the ghetto to the other, and it was designed to weaken the people who were in minimal caloric intake. In the morning, they take us to work. But nobody needs this work. I remember they forced the people to carry big stones, heavy stones. You know, it's about 20 people, everybody take a stone, and you're supposed to carry them, as they told you, the, 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 in this direction. In one side, stay the Nazis, in the other side, and everybody keep big till you, till you finish. If you fail, boom, they kill you immediately here. With me happened, not this what you know, people ask me, how do you survive? I can answer you why I survived. You know, one day I failed. And he got to shoot me, but the gun didn't work. They take off from me all the clothes. And they beat me. I feel the first time I feel, and then no conscience. I stand up only in the morning. And you know, I, I, I crawled, I crawled to this house, and I remained allowed. Dysentery was rampant in the ghetto, which is a bacterial disease which causes significant diarrhea. But one of the Romanian physicians that my father recalls very well by the name of Dr. Angel decided to poison some of the wells with dysentery to see if certain medications would provide some relief to rapidly deteriorating people. His randomized clinical trial, of course, was not a success. My father did not perish during that episode. He provided a study, and he studied how a medicine works on the dysentery. Again, I was lucky. He picked up a group for 100 or 200 people and gave them some pills. 
this was a sorrow I used. In October of 1941, they were marched again along the Dniester River and crossed into Ukraine in the terrible area called Transnistria. Transnistria was uh, an area where hundreds of thousands of Jews were brought in from all over Ukraine, Poland, Romania, and the Balkans. They were brought there for extermination. My father also recalls upon crossing the river, the Zonder Commander D. which operated in that area, collected all the elderly and sick Jews, marched them into the forest, and never to be seen again. That was the last day that he saw his, her grandmother. We have no way of knowing where she was buried. At that point, where the ghetto, the march into ghetto in the town of Yedinets in the Vinitsa area of Ukraine. They were sleeping in a long barn without any windows or doors. They stayed there for four months until March of 1942. The terrible cold and terrible malnutrition contributed to innumerable death. And we walked maybe a month. We passed to a very famous ghetto, Berzat in the name. And they brought us a group of about 200 people in a village. And they put us in a barn where it was before cows. But what they did, they put us in the barn, they took away the doors from both sides, they broke all the windows, and it was terrible to stay. And don't forget, this was November. It wasn't a camp. It wasn't nothing. No Nazis. No nothing. We was alone here. We was to put, they put us here to die. No food, no heat, no nothing. In March of 1942, they were marched into a ghetto in the town of Trostinets. And one night, my father recalls that his father, Naftali Trachtenbreut, was not moving. He died from endemic typhus and malnutrition. He was buried in a communal grave without any monument marking where human life was taken. After two weeks, they were marched again to a different town of Obodivka, also in Ukraine. Most of the Jews were weakened severely by the disease, as I mentioned previously. And my father, little brother Aaron, stumbled and fell. He couldn't get up and was shot by a Nazi guard. His body was placed in a common grave with other victims, but again, the precise location was unknown. Only two Trachtenbroids were left from the immediate family. In the town of Abadivka, his uncle, Jona or Jonathan Trachtenbroi died from the gangrene, as well as his aunt, Hexa, died from typhus. At that time, at the end of 1942, one of their former neighbors from Brichane, whom they met during the forced marches, related to them that Dr. Abraham Trachtenbroi's wife was in a ghetto in a small town of Trostinets where they stopped before. They were able to contact her, and she convinced the local Jewish government body with, to allow more people to stay in her one room. Therefore, seven people were in a room. At that time, the Romanian government decided not to send any more Jews into extermination camps. My father actually was given a job at the age 15 at sugar factory to which he had to work one hour each day and then back. But that was a relief. 
he was able to eat with other slave labor workers in a cafeteria and was paid eight German marks per day. He brought soup to his mother and his other relatives. Finally, in, ap in April of 1944, the ghetto was liberated by the Soviet Union Army. They walked four days back to Brichane to find an empty house, but were able to sleep there. The greatest miracle occurred at the age of 16 for my father. The dog Murchik came to meet him. He survived and met them at the house. Apparently the people who took my father's house kept him. My grandmother did bury the family Shabbat copper candlesticks as well as some gold coins in the garden before they had to leave and the items did survive. Now my eldest son Michael and his wife Catherine Trachtenbroid have the candle candlesticks in their house. And I brought with me something to show to you. I, I have a piece of a gold crown that was made from the gold pieces that my grandmother hid before we immigrated to United States, no gold was able to take out, so they made some crowns for the teeth, which of course had to be removed when I came to United States to place appropriate dental hardware. But this is a small connection that I have personally to what happened to my ancestors. We all immigrated in 1975. I was 17 years old. I graduated from the medical school in Russia. I had a very successful, successful practice. You were a neurosurgeon? And, and after, neurosurgery, after 25 years, my wife was a doctor too. My wife t tell me, what will be the future of our son? No future. The anti-Semitism grows by hours. And we decided to escape. Because it was impossible to leave, we left Russia. And I applied. I get in this day a call, if you will not withdraw, you'll kill your son. And again, I don't know God. It was the economy in Russia. If you remember, it was the leader Brezhnev. The economy was very bad. And President Ford visited Russia. After his visit, it became easier to escape from the country. And we escaped in 1975. Is this and you we and come your wife to and your son? Yeah. And, we, and with my mother, she was a lot too. And we came to America. God bless this country. And we was two years in, uh, in uh, New York because we have to study language. It was the Jewish organization, Nayana. She paid for us. She paid for uh, the Nayana for uh, rent. She gets money for, to, 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 to buy food, to make the living. In, in New York is a big hospital, Montefiore Hospital. And I w went to this hospital and they accept me like a technician in the X-ray department. No, and I had $300 a week. This was money. And my wife worked in a nursing home. She was saying something. She had $300 too. We had money to support my son to study. The yeshiva didn't charge them nothing, the, the college. And, you know, one day 
in the X-ray department came a woman and I was sitting, she a look at me, my God, I saw an old who worked for me in Russia, but she left Russia a few years before. She started crying, why, why, why are you doing it? She went on to Bridgeport, Connecticut. It is from New York about our hour, Tony to drive. And she told the rabbi that you know my doctor he's he's doing well, I don't know what he's doing. The rabbi called me to come. And he called me, if you don't have money on the train, you take somebody, I'll give you back the money. I came. And this rabbi was very influential in this town, Bridgeport. And he introduced me to the mayor. And the mayor told me, you know, you don't have the license, but you may be the hell director. We didn't have in Bridgeport ears. A, a, a doctor, a health director. The son, I get a good salary. And I had the possibility to uh, prepare for, uh, for the exams. And then I get the license, and I open my office in Bridgeport. Then I went to college in New York, and I was going to start medical school. Then I went on a six-week trip to Israel and met my future wife, Sherry Friedman, who just finished UT, uh, UT in Austin, and I finished Yeshiva University. And then I came to visit her after my first year in college, in medical school, and the second year we were married by Rabbi Scheinberg here in San Antonio. My father had recalled the kindness, as I mentioned previously, of Stepan Vladislavsky, how he shared their house and how he kept them away from the Nazis, at least for the night. Unfortunately, the number of righteous people paled before the numbers of collaborators and number of people who did not wish to be bothered by the Jewish questions. All the allies did know about Auschwitz, Treblinka, and other killing camps, but no country offered the Jews a place of refuge. The only countries that saved all of their Jews are Denmark and Bulgaria. In 2008, we all went to, back to Europe and to Ukraine. I had to show my children and my wife where the Trachtenbroids came from. And we were very fortunate to see the town where my father was born and we went to the cemetery. And there the, my children saw the graves of Nachman Trachtenbroid, my father's grandfather. And of course the grandmother wasn't buried there. And there is a monument there listing all the members of the Trachtenbroid family who were never, did not have a resting place, but the name are listed there. And it was a very powerful moment for my children, myself and Sherry, because we recited memorial prayers which had not been said there probably in 50 years. So out of the town of uh, 9,000 people, where 90% were Jewish before 1941, there was one Jewish family left, and there were physicians. So there were only three people left in that town. Yes. Yeah, my father always did. They didn't want to participate purchase any goods, they would never buy a Mercedes. They even instilled it in me. So for many years I would 
check where the products were made. I, I don't do it anymore. He is religious, yes. He, he, when he was able to drive and walk, he attended a, a Rod Fay Shalom. And uh, he's still very religious. No, very openly. My grandmother told me more. There was the first time in the past couple of weeks where we spent about 10 hours together that I got all the, all the, all the details and I was very leery. He remembered all the details, but there was a book published actually. So everything my dad told me was so true. I was amazed, the precision. We became so much closer over the past three days that's you know of the past of the past days over three days or four days I met with him than previously. My father really opened up in such details and he cried and I felt very, very close to him that I haven't had probably in ten to twenty years. Yes, for me, for me, a defining moment was about 10 years ago when I was on rounds in a hospital and there was a patient's name uh, on the board which I had to see by the name of um, Eichmann. So I asked one nurse, is she, oh, jokingly, is she re related to Adolf? And that nurse looked at me and said, who is Adolf? I told her, have you heard of Adolf Eichmann? She said, no. I asked her, have you ever heard of Final Solution? She said, is that a new game show? So for that week when I rounded with the nursing personnel, I provided the villain of the day, starting with Eichmann, which the next day I presented Stalin, which out of six nurses nobody heard of. Then I presented Pol Pot. I thought maybe the, no one heard of him. And then was Idi Amin. Nobody heard of him as well. So after that, my wife said I driving myself too distracted and too upset that people don't know history. And also college education, women and men who didn't know anything. So that's when I felt that I need to teach at least my children what it was like through my father's memories and thoughts and have a recording of everything. So now, thank God, I have everything written up with some connections and my children would uh, appreciate that. But I think education is so important because people do forget. The other experience that I had was my wife. We were taking a course together and graduate Jewish literature at UTSA and one of the students said that Holocaust is a hoax, is a hoax. Well, and, and he truly believed it. Uh, the, the professor was incredible and he explained them everything, but I don't think, I couldn't believe that there are students in the 21st, 22nd century think that it was all a, that the Jews didn't die, they just hide, hid somewhere. He has very bad PTSD still. He's still, the sense of hunger, physical hunger never goes away. Unless he's totally full, he feels deprived. So that sense of hunger and fear that there is not enough food never went away after 70 years. Thank you, Dr. Trachtenbreut, for telling us your family's experience in Romania during the Holocaust. Many don't realize the widespread destruction of Jews throughout Eastern Europe and the various countries that played a role in this destruction. Your father's resilience aided him in surviving the Holocaust. There are many lessons that we can take from the horrors of the Holocaust that can help us make a change in the world around us. 
For more information, please visit our website at hmmsa.org.